how you doing? So the title of my presentation is the playbook to hiring your first VP of sales and not screwing it up. Um, I do this literally every day with a wide, wide range of clients, sort of helping them in and around hiring a VP of sales, maybe replacing a VP of sales. Um, so this is kind of what I do. I'll toggle sort of between the, the founder perspective of hiring a VP of sales, as well as a first time uh, or a, uh, somebody that wants to become a first time VP of sales. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, I was the 15th employee for LinkedIn and their first head of sales, uh, joining the company back in 2000, late 2005 when everybody thought it was a spam company. <laughs> um, was the 10th employee and VP of sales for EchoSign, so I worked for Jason uh, Lemkin for about six years, uh, half of which was EchoSign, the other half of which was uh, Adobe post-acquisition. So I wanted to get the experience of working for a Fortune 500 tech company. So I got two and a half years of that, and that'll likely be the last of that. <laughs> um, fifth employee in VP of sales for TalkDesk, uh, which was recently evaluated at $2 billion. So I was their first employee in the, in the United States. And so I consult and advise for startups, about 35 startups over the last three, three and a half years. So. So talking about hiring your first VP of sales is, is obviously, uh, everybody knows the stat about what percentage of startups fail. Anybody wanna share that? What percentage of startups ultimately will not make it? Anyone? 95%, 90%, roughly 90%. Um, roughly about eight out of 10 uh, first VP of sales hires for startups will also fail, right? So. And they will also sort of average tenure is about 11 months. Um, so if you get it wrong, the consequences are essentially you're gonna lose one year of your startup life. Uh, for most startups, that's the difference between life or death. You don't get, you don't get to have a mulligan on that year. Um, regardless of that, the trajectory of your company is forever changed, right? So you look at companies, uh, top 10 SaaS companies in history, um, you know, none of those companies got their first VP of sales wrong. Um, so, so the, the consequences are, are, are tangible. Um, if you're a CEO and you want to pull the trigger, um, so if you got your first VP of sales wrong and you want to pull the ripcord after three months, and that's certainly something that I've advised, that's something that Jason advises, but the reality is there's political consequences either way. If you hold on to them too long, that's a year of your life. If you pull the ripcord after three months, that's a lot of capital with your investors you may not be able to get back. So it's just not a scenario that you really wanna find yourself in. And again, you lose confidence in your investors and your board. Uh, and that's, that's a level of loss control early on that's, uh, that's not ideal for a founder. So I wanted to just kind of put some sort of concrete, simple steps together that I'm pretty sure are right. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's gonna reduce your risk to zero, but if you can take a 80% chance of failure and reduce it to 20%, it's about as good as you can hope for. So step one is find a friend. So oftentimes a founder or CEO sort of has two primary influences when they're running this search. One is on the investor side. Uh, two is on the retained or the executive search side. And the reality is, is both of those parties have an agenda, right? Which is to get somebody in place and check that box as fast as possible. For you, there's really no reason to rush here, okay? I'm assuming you're running a VP of sales search because you've had some level of success and you wanna double down on that or capitalize on that. Um, so for you, um, Find somebody, so it could be anybody, you can come up to me after this and I can give you a list of 10 people, but find somebody that's been a VP of sales before, successfully in a startup, scale that to some level of success um, and make that person sort of an independent arbiter of that process. Uh, they don't have an agenda. Um, you're probably gonna get, maybe give them some shares in an advisor. You may pay them, but the reality is, is they're gonna be somebody that's gonna be your safety net through the course of that search, okay? So have an objective voice with experience. Without it, you're likely to make a mistake. Step two, define your ideal candidate. 
So I have a process, sort of a checklist. Um, obviously, the at the top of the list is somebody that's been in a startup, been successful, scaled, maybe had one exit, maybe had more than one. Uh, that's your ideal. That's your ideal profile. Acceptable profile: someone that's been a proven success, building through your stage and is ready to go beyond. Less acceptable is somebody that's been a number two. Sorry. Somebody that's been a number two, so somebody that has been a right hand to a VP of sales that's taken a company from zero to 50 or zero to 100. And then last resort is somebody out of a big company like Salesforce or Oracle. Um, again, for all the reasons that have been stated before, but those are people that, generally speaking, are not going to be comfortable walking to a scenario without any brand, um, without customers, without potentially even a pitch and a message. Um, so I would avoid that at all costs, generally. Okay. Uh, one of the mistakes, I think two of the mistakes, actually, that I see a lot of founders make is they tend to aim high, too high or too low. So they come out and they say, you know, it's sort of manifest destiny that, you know, somebody that my magical dream candidate that scaled company X, Y, or Z from zero to 50 or zero to 100 is going to come off the beach and stop whatever they're doing, which is probably not much <laughs> except golf, um, and jump back in and take a risk to build your company. Uh, it's not going to happen most of the time. Okay. Um, I can give you 20 people that I would identify as like, here are your perfect first VP of sales hires, and you're probably going to miss on all 20. And if you want to land one, it's going to take a long time. Um, you can't just start today, right? So a lot of times this is a very, very long game. Um, the best recruiters that end up with getting the best VPs of sales do it over six months, a year, sometimes more than that. And again, <laughs> unless you have time, um, it's probably not going to work. Okay. So the odds of landing your dream candidate are low. Identify sort of the next level down, but you should shoot high, right? So when you talk about um, whether that's Jim Erbold from Box, um, Matt Cooley uh, from Quit, a lot of these people are probably unrecruitable, but you should meet them, right? And you should prepare for a long process potentially to make this hire. I would say don't make the hire, then make the wrong hire. So if you need to wait longer, if you need to prepare your board for a longer process, um, don't just check the box because the board told you to. Don't just check the box because the retained search firm wants to get the second half of their payment. Um, you take as long as you need. And uh, in my opinion, no hire is better than the wrong hire. Okay. So aim high, aim low, aim in the middle. But you should be talking to all those levels in parallel. Step four, and this is really, for me, this is kind of a mandatory deal. Who's coming with them? So one of the first VPs of sales I had in my career had this incredible resume. See, well, at that time, thought that was an incredible resume, but Siebel, Oracle, all these companies, um, nice guy, loved to drink Maker's Mark, super social, all that stuff. And I noticed that every time we were looking to build the team or hire people, he was always asking me, hey, you know anybody we can hire? You know, and I was at that point, you know, 26. I didn't really have much of a network at that point. And I kept coming back to the point of like, why does nobody want to work for you, <laughs> right? You've been doing this for like 20 years. You worked in all these companies. And yet not a single person that ever worked for you in the past wants to come with you. Um, and there was a reason why, right? As he was somebody that, that managed and led teams sort of with a me first attitude, right? He was looking to um, raise and shine his own star over his team. Um, so who's coming with them is a huge, uh, huge factor for me. Um, you're not just vetting the candidate, but you're also vetting the people that they would potentially bring with them. If they're not comfortable sharing that, and again, there's, you know, there's certain rules and ethics involved here. If somebody's gonna give you the names of four or five people they wanna recruit, but then you're not gonna hire them, but then you're gonna go recruit their people. 
even after you've turned them down. I don't really consider that to be a super ethical process. So if anybody does that, then I would say, hey, you got burned. Maybe you don't do it again. But for me, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to violate that principle. So um, who they're going to bring with them is critical that them ideally even like interview them sort of in the process in parallel with the candidate. Um, because for me, for a first time VP of sales, so say you're, um, I don't want to say any, I don't know, what, what is a good age for a first time VP of sales these days? 28, 30. Um, I would hire somebody younger, less experienced, but they had a four or five great people they could bring with them. I, I'd be willing to take that risk over maybe somebody much more experienced that had nobody they could bring with them. So that's how big a factor it is. I've sort of been uh, advocating for this for a while, and I see more and more founders and CEOs that are adopting this as a standard part of their process. Okay. Why does it matter if they're bringing their own people with them? Well, because it's an advantage for you. These are foundational hires. Uh, these are people that are going to help set the culture and set, and set the values for a VP of sales. And again, you're looking to make as many low drama hires as you can as a VP of sales walking into a startup. People that can come in and contribute immediately. People that can, not just at, from a number standpoint, but from a culture and mentoring standpoint. So if you don't have any of those people, you're immediately on a level playing field with everybody else, right? You're recruiting on the merits of whatever your company does, whatever the pitch or whatever the buzz is. But that's really, it's tough to stand out in the recruiting process there. And the quality of the people you hire will probably be reflective of that. Talked about before, don't panic. I used to be a proponent of make the hire, make the hire, give it three months. If it doesn't work, pull the ripcord. We talked a little bit about that earlier, right? And talking about the political capital you lose as a founder. Um, so I've become a bigger believer in, hey, like assuming you're doing something well and doing something right, you have somebody that's managing or leading your team. Um, maybe you stick with that for a while instead of making the wrong hire. And quite frankly, most of the time when a, when a startup hires a VP of sales, it's the wrong hire, everybody knows, right? Everybody knows, all the employees know, all the salespeople know, potentially even the board knows, but hey, check that box. So do nothing. Um, maybe you have somebody in there, maybe you can promote from within, right? Maybe you have somebody, a manager that could be a director, a director that could be a head of, or maybe even a head of that could be a VP of sales. Um, but make the absolute right hire. And if you don't have the right person, if you have doubts and there's doubts within the team on that decision, just don't do it. Okay. So I guess that's the main portion of the slide piece. Um, Happy to open the floor to any questions anyone has um, on the hiring process or anyone that wants to be a VP of sales, anybody who wants an introduction to of people that can help you or help advise you in your search. Uh, yeah, go ahead. What are some of the most important characteristics that goes beyond experience? Um, I would say somebody that, um, you gotta have a fighter on some level, right? The odds are so stacked against you. Um, you have to, you can't, it's not just that you're a fighter, it's that you like the fight. Um, because there's, you know, there are gonna be ups and downs, but there's gonna be downs so low. Uh, I've been through them myself, where you go home and you're like, we should just close the company tomorrow, right? <laughs> We're done. <laughs> it is game over. <laughs> um, and then you go home and it's like, this is something I've had in throughout my career, I don't know why. It's like this, like, hey, you, you, uh, you know, tend to your wounds for a few hours. And then the next morning you wake up and you're thinking about solutions. How do I fix this? Um, how do we flip the script? Uh, how do we change things in our favor? And that's what it takes, uh, I think. Um, I think, you know, and I'm not done with that answer. <laughs> um, Got to be a fighter. You have to be just a relentless recruiter. Um, so recruiting all the time, recruiting even when you're not working, quite frankly, when, you're, when you don't have a job. Um, 
my first job out of college was as a recruiter. And so that's just like the ultimate sort of, you know, you're always thinking about relationship building and you should be recruiting for your career, right? So you should be like, hey, I haven't had a full-time job in a couple of years, right? I, I already know the team. If I were going to take a full-time job somewhere, I know exactly who I'm taking with me. And that's, that's what you need to be doing. It's just relentless on that front. And that's not just recruiting, it's building your brand and establishing your brand and your company's brand. Um, I think you have to be, you have to have no, no taste for politics. Uh, there's no place for politics and bureaucracy. Uh, it's like a pathological meritocracy, you know? It's like, I don't care what you did before. Uh, I don't give a shit. Right. I don't you may have been at Salesforce in 99. You may have been at Box in 2006 or LinkedIn in 2008. I don't care. Like it's what can you do here today now for our company? And if you perform and you put the effort in and you show the values, the company values, then you're moving up or whatever it is that you want to do. Um, and uh, yeah. Does that answer your question? OK. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've blogged about this one a few times, so I can't even remember my own shit that I wrote sometimes, but, uh, you know, I look, I, I want, sorry. Yeah. Um, question is what characteristics of a company are you looking for as a VP of sales? I think that's right to evaluate. Yeah. I would say, um, find something interesting, right? Pers personally interesting that you're like, Hey, that's interesting to me. If it's totally uninteresting, I don't know how you could do it for four years or five years. I can't. If it's uninteresting, I'm just, uh, you know, who gives a shit, you know? <laughs> like, that's been done 20 times, you know? Um, so something interesting, something ambitious, uh, a founder that you, you truly like and truly respect is critical. I would say that's number one for me personally, which means I may never work full time again, but... Uh, um, finding a founder that you want to go invest four to five years of your life with and for, um, because it really is, you know, certainly there's other leaders and executives that come in, but if the VP of sales and the founder CEO are not on the same page, it's not a good thing. Um, from a, from a, like revenue growth in the early stage series, a, like, like if you have a one-to-one -one sort of ARR to funding ratio, that's great, you know? Uh, when I joined TalkDesk, I think it was like three and a half, four million to like two million. Um, that's a really solid ratio early. Obviously, the more money you raise, the more of that ratio comes beyond one to one. But that's those are early good factors because, you know, the more money you raise and the lower your ARR is, the further behind the eight ball you are as a startup. And you're constantly trying to make it up. And... I've seen VP of sales get swallowed up in like a founder's own less to raise money on no revenue. Um, it's not a good position to be in, right? You want to have some solid fundamentals there. Um, can you recruit, can you recruit the team to that company? Right. And that's all another good indicator of the people, you know, the people that you're connected to that want to work for you or work with you. Can you bring them? Are they interested? If they're not interested, it's a little bit of a concern. Uh, uh, first question was co a co-located VP of sales. So I'm, a, so start, I'm assuming startup in San Francisco with a VP of sales in Salt Lake, that type of deal. Uh, depends on what do you want to do in Salt Lake? <laughs> is Salt Lake, is that, do you have plans for Salt Lake City, like beyond or at some certain type of scale? Certainly I think you see most scaling companies are doing something outside the Bay Area, right? Uh, Utah, Phoenix, the Robbie Allen over here is made famous uh, as a startup, a uh, hotbed of startup activity. <laughs> um, Phoenix, uh, Austin, you know, uh, LA, I guess. I don't know, is LA a hub or is LA kind of like a, you know, I don't, I'm not sure what LA is yet. Um, yeah, I would say uh, you can do it, but I would say more in a scenario in which you're doing pretty enterprise-y upmarket scenarios where you want your VP of sales uh, flying to your clients. For an inside sales model, it's obviously a total non-fit, right? 
uh, unless you're going to do something in that regional market at some point. What was the other question? Comp range and OTE is a function of your current revenue. Um, I mean, you're you're going <laughs> to. You're going to pay through the nose regardless for for a good candidate. Um, so I'm not sure there is any one rule around that. Um, let me think about that one. I'll get back to you. Go ahead. How do you know when to, um, you know, the challenge of topping an existing early employee that's in a sales function of sorts mm -hmm. versus um, just promoting that early employee? What in your opinion, when is the right time to just promote that early employee into the VP of sales versus topping them with an outside hire? Uh, well, obviously, it depends on how successful that internal person is. Um, so, you know, they, they have to have you on some sort of trajectory that you want to be on. I don't think there's any doubt about that. They have to have proven that they can recruit um, and train and, and hire and onboard people. Um, so, I mean, I'm a big believer of promote from within, but typically a VP of sales promoting sort of next level people. Um, I do think some companies definitely will top people too early. I think that's, a, I think that's an epidemic, quite frankly. Um, if you have a VP of sales that took you from one to 15 million in 18 months, um, it's pretty good, right? Or, or even 24 months or even 36 months for that matter. Um, and so like, I think you should, they should be given the opportunity to take you from uh, one to 20 and then from 20 to 50 or 20 to 40. And too often VP of sales often heavily influenced by the board. Yeah, that's great. We got our one to 20 guy. Let's go get our 20 to 50 gal. And I think it's a mistake. Uh, I think a lot of times it does more damage than, than good. Uh, I think, most companies overcome it because they're already at 20 million, right? You're probably not going to be able to kill them. Um, so I, I would say um, that's a leadership failure for a lot of CEOs, right? Because CEOs just sort of want to outsource the issue instead of saying, hey, like, here are the things I'm tasking or challenging you to do. This is how you need to grow with the company. This is what I want to see over the next six to nine months. But they don't know how to process it and communicate it. So they just say, hey, let's go get somebody bigger. And the reality is, is like, you know, <laughs> um, unless a lot of the things that you're still doing from one to 20, you're still doing a lot of those things from 20 to 40. It's a reality. You're doing more of those things and you're doing the things that the person you hired that's only done 250 million plus are going to be tasked to do. So I think I didn't answer your question. <laughs> Uh, go ahead. Uh, my, my company is a very technical product and some engineering software, and it's a new category that we're creating like, uh, from scratch, and we've already made the mistake of uh, trying to hire our first VP of sales. Any thoughts given, given that scenario and uh, what their attention to the Yes. Uh, I don't know if anybody heard that. He talked about uh, he's selling a product in the engineering space or to engineering as a buyer. And I already hired a VP of sales, already fired a VP of sales. What do I do now? Um, new, new category. Doesn't, doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Got it. <laughs> uh, okay. I would say right, what's, what's going well? Here, let's put the mic up. Let's have it back and forth. Uh, engagement with the, uh, the lower level kind of end user people. We're working the, you know, we're getting better at selling yeah. up in the market, but really all, What's working well is my co-founder CEO leading this leading the sale, and Got it. everyone else we've brought in as a sales leader has has just flopped. <laughs> and he's very technical. He do, doesn't yeah. come from a business background, but yes. he's strategic. You know. Yeah, I've seen this one. Still in founder-led sales. Seen it more than once. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's your C he is the CTO. CEO. CEO. Yeah. And it's his. Is he a he's a technical background? You said. Yep. Okay. Um, and no salespeople currently. Performant in the company. Uh, we have a we have a couple that are okay, but not not VP material. No, no, no. But I mean, from a like, they're closing deals. Yeah. They're scaling and we ramping. have one besides the CEO who can close deals. Got it. Um, well, I mean, obviously, I could say uh, you know open up another VP of sales search and get and get your second person. Um, 
I mean, you're going to have to do that, obviously, at some level. Um, you see, it's it's not that uncommon for a CEO or a founder to uh, stand in as sort of a surrogate VP of sales for some period of time. Um, I don't know, is he a natural mentor and coach and all that kind of stuff? Um, but I would take the reps you have and shadow him as much as possible, bottle as much of what he does and says and knows as you can. Maybe a product like Gong is a good product for that, where you start recording and, tra and, and transcribing and analyzing all your sales calls. I think Gong is one of the best sales enablement products I've seen come out over the last de five years in this space. Um, but that's what I would do is try and get those two reps you have on the level as much as possible if they're not. Um, and then, you know, try and find, you know, are, they, are where are you based? Uh, Berkeley, across the, across okay. the bridge. Uh, maybe try to connect with some VPs of sales that have maybe sold in like the engineering space that can sort of act as advisors, surrogates, helpers for you. It's not free usually, but it's worth it. Um, and, and see if maybe, you know, Hey, like maybe I can tap into who they know. Like, uh, I'm trying to think of, you know, maybe somebody that was like early selling like GitHub or, you know, so try and find a couple of VPs that have sold into, sold to the buyer or into the market that, that you're, that you're trying to and make them, you know, sort of give them some stake in the company and they'll help, you know, and if they can't help. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the next step is. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Uh, do you have any tips for uh, CEOs? Uh, we've hired a VP of sales recently. She's performing really well, but with the characteristic of an effective VP of sales comes a certain swagger, comes a certain, hey, I'm closing deals so I can do whatever I want. You know, this sort of uh, impact on the culture. Um, definitely different management style required there as opposed to the rest of the team. So you're saying that she doesn't have the swagger you want? I, she does. Oh, she and, does. You know, okay. it's great for sales. It's bad for culture. Got it. <laughs> um, is she a legitimate, like, VP of sales? Has been a VP of sales before, all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Okay. Um, at a successful company, I'm assuming? Yeah. Okay. Um, I would tell them that that's not good for the culture, <laughs> at a minimum. Sit her down and say... Um, I'm assuming your company is probably just as many engineers, if not more than salespeople. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we've tried the coaching, but the, the pushback we get is I'm closing deals, I'm, I'm making revenue happen, so I get a I pass. Mean, generally, you don't want your, at some point you want your VP of sales to be managing, building, coaching, and not closing deals, which should significantly maybe temper their ego a tiny bit. Um, so I would say, um, you know, hopefully there's people on the team working for her. Yeah, that, that makes can, sense. So, so uh, that, coach toward the leadership sure. piece of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's great that she can close deals, but obviously you hired her to build and run your sales organization, not be an enterprise AE, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Thanks. So I know it's a range based on stage of the company and experience of the salesperson, uh, but can you give some ranges on? total compensation expectations and kind of what the breakdown is between uh, equity and base and commission or bonus? Yeah. So what's, what's a t what are the total comp ranges that to expect to have to pay essentially? Okay. Um, I would say, I mean, it's loose, right? I mean, sometimes I hear of searches and you're like, oh my God, like that's, that's can't be right, right? But um, I would say somewhere between Three and five hundred k in total comp um, equity. I mean, I can tell you that I can tell you the things that uh, I would take a job for. But um, yeah, I would say it's equity anywhere from one to five percent, depending on the level of experience of the candidate. Uh, if you want to get, you know, a been there, done that, multiple exits, you know reduce the risk as far as you can down the ladder type of hire, you're going to pay uh, a heavy price on equity and you're not going to get those people without it period. So, okay. Uh, any other questions anyone has out there? Yeah. Comfortable with uh, a new VP of sales coming in and using an outside coach. So whether it's Brendan or someone else, but uh, talk to me about that 
dynamic? What should our expectations be? And uh, what should we budget for? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's a good thing. You know, I mean, there's, you know, VP of sales can be a pretty lonely job, even for, you know, working for a great CEO and with other great leaders. And the, the, the reality is, is, um, you know, they'll be judged on performance and their number. Um, and I think, you know, bringing somebody in as a coach or a consultant or advisor um, can help eliminate mistakes as a sounding board, right? Because there's so much creation happening in a startup, you know, that you're just, it's, co it's constantly like creation, iteration, beta test, back to the lab. You're doing it all the time. Uh, so having somebody that can sort of, you know, help guide them in their decision making process, help tell them when they're about to, you know, drive over a cliff, um, I think is, is a worthwhile investment. Um, you know, that could be paid in stock and equity that or could be paid in cash, could be paid in both, depending on how much, how, how, how involved you want them with your company and with your VP of sales. But I would totally recommend it. And not just because that's what I do for a living. <laughs> Uh, I think that's it, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks.